Well, hello once again. It is Brett Quintine and Matt Mankiewicz. It is a Friday, and you know what? Fridays mean it's a kickoff for a weekend of baseball. We love baseball. That's exactly why we're here. The Yankees are in first place. Phillies are in first place. Texas Rangers in first place. But you know what, Matt? Something that is kind of surprising? The Cleveland Indians, the best record in the American League. And the only problem is nobody in Cleveland knows about it. <laughs> and we'll be talking about that in much greater detail. How come nobody's been showing up to Progressive Field despite the fact that the Cleveland Indians are playing the best baseball they have in three years? But we have a lot more in store. Absolutely. Max Scherzer is 3-0. and Excuse me, Max Scherzer 4-0 and for the Detroit Tigers. He'll oppose the Indians later on this evening. Other stories? Well, in the American League West, a battle of unbeatens. Trevor Cahill against C.J. Wilson. Good pitching matchup. We know that the A's always have good pitching, although they don't get that big fanfare. And it's no surprise that the Rangers and C.J. Wilson are cruising in the division. Well, that's one thing because the Rangers are the best balanced team in the American League West, no question about it. Defending American League champions with very good reason. And the funny thing about it is that they went on this wild tear to start the season, sputtered a little bit, but it's the pitching that seems to be getting them right back out of the hole again, which is what the pitching is supposed to do. Absolutely, and in a ballpark like that with the Oakland Athletics, which is going to be another name, I forget, I just saw the other day, it's going to be another something.com arena, stadium. Now, is this because somebody bought the company that's sponsoring it now, or did the contract run out? I think the contract actually ran okay. out, but it gets to the point, I'm all about corporate names and sponsorships, but after a while it gets ridiculous. But speaking of the A's, something that's always intrigued me, and again, it goes to that good pitching, all of that foul territory does not help any of the hitters, it helps the pitchers. Oh, absolutely. In fact, during the glory years, and we're talking about the two different eras, we're talking about 72, 73, 74, we're talking about the late 80s into the early 90s, the A's hit more home runs on the road than at home. And also in the power hitting late 90s, when you had Giambi and McGuire there, and Canseco starting to tail off a little bit, but still very much a force, even though they didn't pitch, the home runs still, they hit more on the road than at home in many cases, mainly because of that foul territory, because if you have a big fly ball hitter, they foul something off, it gets caught. Also in the American League, and we're staying in the American League at least for the next five, ten minutes or so, and feel free to call us. 347-480-1724 is the number to call. Double headers these days, Matt and I have talked a lot about they're not really scheduled too often. Ironically, the Oakland A's actually have a scheduled doubleheader in July. But again, it seems like we always have so, so much to talk about. There was a doubleheader yesterday in Minnesota. Ben Zobris took center stage. Eight runs batted in. <laughs> That's and amazing. Well, one reason why he had so many runs batted in is because the Twins just gave him pitches he liked. And he's a dead red fastball hitter and just keep throwing him fastballs, he'll hit him. Well, that's another problem. The <laughs> Twins are in a little bit of trouble right now. Yes, They're they off are. to a slow start. Everybody thought that, you know, it was just the Yankees owning them again when they came into New York. But they really haven't gone on any appreciable tear since Correct. then. Correct. John Mauer's obviously been injured. Yes, that's definitely hurt them. But you know what? That isn't necessarily the deal breaker. The deal breaker here is they haven't pitched. Yes. And that's what a team like that banks on, no pun intended. Like you said, Liriano, they're just not getting those quality starts. And these days, I think we'd both agree, the term quality start is very loose. Six innings, three runs, mm -hmm. that's not dominant pitching. But they're not even getting that. They're falling out of ball games early. That's the problem. When guys are going four and two-thirds and giving up five runs, when guys are, you know, when you, Garden Hire has to use five pitchers, remember, too, that Joe Nathan is now a setup guy. Right. He, ba he is backed out of the closer's role because he's still recovering from Tommy John surgery. He blew a couple of saves in the space of a week. So did Mariano Rivera, sure. but you don't see that happening with him. But still, they are having some problems in the bullpen, even though Caps has been solid. Mm -hmm. But you got to get to him. Sure. Absolutely. And that's the thing that's really been hurting them right now is that they, they're using up everybody right now. And yes, teams go through that on a routine basis. But you don't want to fall too far behind this division. The only thing you're hoping for right now is if Cleveland comes back to earth. Will they? Well, we don't know. But you might, we might as well bring it up right now, mm -hmm. okay? 
The Cleveland Indians won 10 games in a row at home. Absolutely. I believe they're, uh, is it now at 11? It's 10. It's 10, 10 as we speak, 16-8 overall. 16-8 mm -hmm. overall. Okay. 9,000 people <laughs> showing up at Progressive Field. That's terrible. That's just terrible. Now, <laughs> we'll really be is. fair. We'll be fair that the weather's been pretty bad. And, uh, but you know what? We've had lousy weather in New York. Absolutely. And, <coughs> excuse me. We get 40,000 a game, and that's also down. Don't get me wrong. Again, the Yankees are suffering a little bit of a hit in attendance as well. But there is a Cleveland fan out there. Uh, he operates waiting for next year, and he has his, <laughs> little, his Facebook account. He did a regression curve okay. of the Indians' 2007 season. Now, of course, Yankee fans remember that because the Indians dumped them in the division series yes. in 07. Okay. So, and of course, the flies. I was going to say, Jabba Chamberlain had a little bit of problem on the hill in late in the ball game, and that ultimately became a commercial, and it's become sort of a, um, sort of a, do you remember when scenario? Yeah. And indeed, yes, you're yes. absolutely right with well, that. Well, I was quoting the book of Exodus on that okay, one. Okay, <laughs> sure. But Exodus chapter 8, and I forget what verse it is, but hey, if you know, give us a call. In any case, the plague of, of locusts, no, not really locusts, it was midges, actually, that uh, did the Yankees in that game. But the, the, the regression curve he has here is how Indians' attendance increased over the course of the 2007 season. And it was at a low of under 15,000, you know, early in the season, we're talking about April, May, and increased to, to capacity as uh, the uh, home dates increased. So we're talking about uh, running down home dates, first 10 home dates, you're way under 20,000. And it started building up, and you got into sure. May, and you started filling up the ballpark a little bit, and you had your off nights. You had your Tuesdays and Wednesdays where it dropped Absolutely. below 20 again. But it got steadily better and better and better. And hopefully this is going to help the Indians because, let's face it, that means money, and right. it means opportunities to build your team, opportunities to become a buyer instead of a seller Absolutely. at the trade deadline. And if they can sustain it, and they're sustaining it with a lot of the same guys who helped them three True. years ago, that's good for them. But one of the big problems, of course, with the Cleveland Indians is that they have not been able to put these things together consistently. Fausto Carmona has right. been terrific. Absolutely. He was a big part of that 07 run as well. Very true. And I'll say this, I mean, with the Indian fans, it's really no excuse. And hopefully, as you mentioned, the chart hopefully will prove right. But the Indians themselves, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're putting a winning product on the field, unlike our fans in Pittsburgh, who you can't always blame the fans because the Pirates just haven't had a winning product on the field. But when your team is leading the division, albeit, yes, it's still April, but you're playing 60, excuse me, 667 baseball, you need to come out, especially in your big weekend dates, mm -hmm. such as this, a division rival, and we're not saying there needs to be 43, 44,000 people, but at the same time, a crowd of 9,000 just does not cut it. We spoke briefly of the Yankees, obviously, a few years back. They did lose that series to Cleveland. Phil Hughes, you and I spoke about him a little bit earlier, prior to the broadcast, mm -hmm. with his dead arm. Let's hope that he becomes a factor, but I'll say this. The Yankees are getting the pitching that they need, and combined with the bats, that's why they're leading the division. I'll tell you what, Phil Hughes, we brought something up here with thoracic outlet syndrome, yes. which is the mm -hmm. problem he has, which cuts off the nerves in his shoulder and results in the dead arm we're talking about. David Cohn had something somewhat mm -hmm. similar, aneurysm, but his yes. was an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. His Correct. was actually a, a balloon, a, a weakness in, in the vein mm -hmm. or the artery. And that was corrected by basically a graft. They just cut sure. the bad part out and sewed the two of them together. And he came back, and he was came absolutely terrific. Came back and terrific. was great. Yeah. He was absolutely great. The funny great. thing was, his last start, before they put him on the DL, he was mm -hmm. pretty good, too. Only trouble is he couldn't feel anything in his hand. <laughs> now, Hughes, there are very, very different ways you can treat this. You can treat it with surgery if you absolutely have to, but they would prefer to treat it with exercise. It brings back mm -hmm. a name yeah, that, you know, again, you have to be of a certain age to remember, mm -hmm. maybe, or just from Houston, J.R. <laughs> Richard. Okay. Yes. We brought J.R. Richard up. If you're not familiar with him, big, blazing right-hander. Uh, very similar to Doc Gooden in that he had a great curveball as well. And uh, he... Imposing. Six, yeah, six, yeah. six, eight. Big guy. Mm -hmm. And he was a big part of the Astros' ascendance in the late 70s into the Absolutely. early 80s. And what happened with him was he started feeling the dead arm. Doctors could not figure out what it was. 
In fact, he was getting nailed in the press because people thought he was dogging it. Correct. All of a sudden, he collapses on the mound. Absolutely. Okay. Stroke. And that was a shame. That really was a shame. I know we're talking about the injuries, but now that we're talking about it, and not even looking at his statistics, he had some outstanding years. I want to say one year, did he strike out 370 or 380? He had it some was sick amazing. numbers. Yeah, yes, sick, I will say that, yeah, he had some he had sick some numbers. Excellent numbers. On some not-so-great Astro teams. He had low ERA. He, had, he led the league in strikeouts, I want to say at least twice. He was dominant. Matt mentioned, yes, kind of like a Dwight Gooden. I would agree, but I'm even going to say intimidating like a Randy Johnson only from the right side. Just yes. a tall guy, just comes at you. 6'8", 222, by the way. Is that's a big weight. boy, especially for someone 30 years ago. I mm -hmm. mean, that's a huge man. And he piled up the strikeouts, had his stroke in more or less his prime. He had at least a few more all-star seasons. Had two straight 300 strikeout seasons, 303 and 313, 78 and 79. And he was even 10-4 in his last full season in 1980, which is when he had the stroke. That's and he was a big part, as I said. He also had Nolan Ryan on those teams. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so imagine a tandem sure. like that, him mm -hmm. and Nolan Ryan. But what happened was, where I'm going with this, mm -hmm. is that later on I read an article about him having this disease, this Correct. ailment, and it wasn't correctly diagnosed, and which led to the stroke. And, that's and really that, is. first of all, modern medicine, thank you very much. Modern mm -hmm. imaging with CAT scanners and MRIs and things like that, thank you very much. And, you know, very fortunate that they are now looking for stuff like this with the uh, live arm, dead arm problems Correct. that some guys run into. Normally, it's an after effect of Tommy John surgery or even a precursor to it mm -hmm. could lead to it. But the problem was in the shoulder, not the elbow. Right, and that's and as, as you mentioned, 30 years ago, doctors didn't know exactly what to look for. It was a whole new ball game. It's a different ball game now. Not only are the athletes bigger, stronger, and faster, the doctors are much better now than they were 30 years ago. In particular, sports medicine, these guys are trained to look for certain things in athletes. And while we're seemingly seeing more and more guys go on the DL, these athletes, in particular pitchers, are being treated a little bit better as well. So, yeah, it uh, brings back memories, J.R. Richard, Phil Hughes. Who would have thought there would be a comparison between those two? But in the end, yes, medicine links it all up. Different eras, different type of pitchers, but similar ailment. Now, what this bodes for Phil Hughes, nobody knows. Nobody's going to speculate because, again, you can fix it with exercise. You can fix it with surgery. We don't know what it's going to take. Right now, we know he's out. Fortunately for the Yankees, Freddie Garcia mm -hmm. and Bartolo Colon, two guys that were on the scrap heap back Absolutely. in March, have pitched well. Absolutely. I said earlier in the, I want to even say it might have been the initial episode of the warning track, when they made those signings that if at least one of those three guys and the other third person I'm throwing in there is Mark Pryor, if one of those emerged as a bona fide starter, they would be a good team. Now that we have two of those guys starting, I, I shouldn't say starting, but being very effective, I think that bodes very well for the New York Yankees. I think overall, this is going to be a team that is going to be quite competitive as we move towards the course of the season. But right now, we're going to take a break, and on the other side of the break, we're going to talk National League Baseball. We hope to talk a little Dodger talk. We hope to talk about the Atlanta Braves, and they've been doing some not-so-nice things off the field. All that and more when we return on The Warning Track. Live on Sports.com, I'm Peter Schwartz, and we're joined by one of the current. If you want everything sports, you got to tune in to Schwartz on Sports. Tuesday nights at 8 p.m., Peter Schwartz, the esteemed broadcaster, takes on everything sports. He's got everything from high-end pro sports like the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball to alternative sports like extreme games, lacrosse, tennis, golf and everything in between. Joined by Minnesota Vikings Hall of Famer John Randall. 
Last year, you were inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and that is the, the biggest honor that a player uh, can get uh, bestowed on him. What was that feeling like when you were enshrined in that camp? Uh, it was unbelievable. You got to check out Schwartz on sports because there's nothing you know that he doesn't. He knows everything sports. So check it out, 8 p.m. on sports.com, Tuesdays. Welcome back to the warning track. Join us, 347-480-1724 is the number to call, 347-480-1724. Well, we spoke a lot about the American League in the first half of the broadcast. Now let's switch our attention to the National League. And as far as the National League is concerned, closer to home, the National League East, the Atlanta Braves. What a week they've had, and we're not talking on the field. We're talking off the field. Last week, they were in San Francisco. They played good baseball, but at the time, little did we know that their pitching coach, former New York Met Roger McDowell, was having a war of words with a family, a father and two children, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because a ballpark is supposed to be family-friendly and oriented and just not really more than 48 hours ago in Atlanta, Derek Lowe, former everybody, former Red Sox, former Dodger, the whole nine yards, Derek Lowe was drag racing on Peachtree Road. Well, Peachtree Drive Road, who knows? There's a lot of peach trees in Atlanta, but more so pulled over for a DUI. Matt, what's happening in Atlanta? <laughs> well, first of all, Lowe's got a little bit of a reputation yes. for being a party animal. Yes, he is. Let's be mm -hmm. honest. And does this surprise me? No. Uh, is it uh, so rather surprising that it's in the land of uh, where Danny Heatley mm -hmm. had his major accident? People have long forgotten true. that. Very but he true. was a member of the Atlanta Thrashers when he crashed his Ferrari Absolutely. at high speed and killed the passenger, which was, who was a teammate. Mm -hmm. And there's no relationship between the two. Right, correct. But the timing of these two things, and there's no real relationship between the two the events, two, sure. the two Correct. incidents. Roger McDowell got into a shouting match with a couple of fans and used some inappropriate language. And by inappropriate, I don't necessarily mean four-letter words. Correct. I Correct. mean slurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, apparently. Again, well, everything is alleged here. Right. We're the innocent and until mentioning guilty. how much do you value your teeth, all of that sort of stuff. That's, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> well, just, the, mm -hmm. the other problem is, is that Here's a guy who played for the 1986 Mets, which was one of the more closely scrutinized teams in human existence. Mm -hmm. They did a lot. Okay. They, they did, did a lot, lot, but they were watched a lot. Okay, they, they had a lot of interaction with fans. This is a guy who's been around for 30 years, around mm -hmm. baseball for 30 years. Okay, how could you lapse like that? Correct and lose and forget yourself and forget your position Absolutely. and where you are and what you're doing and who you're interacting with and come on roger mcdowell got heckled at shea stadium mm -hmm. he got heckled in new york he got heckled everywhere he got heckled especially on the road because that team was hated right yes they were they hated were. okay they were hated like the yankees were sure okay all of a sudden a family in san francisco gets under his skin. And right there, I think you said the key word, family. It's one thing if it's a couple guys trying to jaw back and forth, but when you see a father with two little girls, I believe it was a girl or a boy, or two, two young children, I don't really see how, as a guy in uniform, player or not, what possesses you to say anything like that? that that's just mind-boggling to me. There could be some target words, okay? Sure. There could be some words like he said something bad about his mother. Uh, okay. Not very true. Very okay. true. Yes. That's that was a claim Roberto Alomar made when he with spat. The spit, yes. Yeah, with mm -hmm. the spitting incident. Okay. There are some don't go there's Correct. where the fan would be guilty. Still, gotta hold it in. Mm -hmm. You gotta call security. Absolutely. You gotta wait. There's a security guy in the dugout. Absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there, in, in, in New York, there are cops in the dugout. Okay, they're in the, uh, the, the alcove where the photographers are. Correct. Okay, very easy. You know, mm -hmm. call somebody over. But yeah. no presence of mind there. 
30 years experience in the game of baseball right. in one of the toughest markets, in the toughest market and well, other tough markets. Sure. And not having the presence of mind to back off, diffuse, throttle it back, and let the professionals handle it. And in the meantime, the Atlanta Braves have decided to handle it for him. They've placed him on administrative leave. Dave Wallace, he is the roving pitching coach for the Atlanta Braves. He'll now take Roger McDowell's spot in the, or I'll say He's a the, former Met pitching coach. Yes, indeed, yes. <laughs> He'll be in the Atlanta Braves dugout serving under uh, Freddie Gonzalez. That's the Atlanta Braves situation. The Philadelphia Phillies had a, I can't say a problem, they made some news, more so one of their pitchers, Roy Oswalt. After a rough start earlier this week, he decided just to up and leave for personal reasons. I guess my problem with him, you're a veteran pitcher. You tell people where you're going. You said you're going to your family down in Mississippi, and he clearly is from that area that was hit hard. Anytime you have a scenario like that, yes, you are obligated to go to your family. You take your suspension, whatever it may be, but just don't walk off. Let people know where you're going. That avoids fines and the whole nine yards and people talking. Well, in the case, I mean, let's, I'm trying to remember, there was a Yankee who did that last year, and I forget which one it was, but, you know, Girardi basically said, hey, he's got something to do. We, right. you know, It's excused. We know what's going on. We know why he's doing it. We just mm -hmm. don't want to tell anybody. Correct. That's Very okay. True. Absolutely. That's right. perfectly okay. He can go to the general manager or, or his manager, Charlie Manuel, and say, look, I got some problems. My house got hit by a tornado. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or somebody close to me got hit by a tornado. Very right. legitimate. And not only that, being a starting pitcher, Correct. he may just get back in time for his next start. You yes, never know. Yes, very true. Okay? And lots of guys, everybody, it's now considered an obligation. that When we were born, okay, our fathers were probably not in the room. Correct. Okay? Because they were outside pacing. Because it wasn't considered, <laughs> That's true. It That's wasn't considered a funny. normal thing to do. It took a generation. Okay? Very true. Now, guys our age... When their kids were born, they were in the room. Yes. Okay. Guys younger than us, same thing. Okay. And guys taking leave from their teams. Yes, that's a new for their rule this year. To be you get born, the paternity leave. It is not only, first of all, legally binding because a baseball mm -hmm. player is a job like any other, but more importantly, it's encouraged. Yes. Yes, it is. Go I, ahead. You know, I never have really kid. thought I'd see the day where you actually get a paternity leave. I think it's great. It's just something that has surprised me because over the years we've always heard maternity leave but now to hear the paternity leave I, it's it's still mind-boggling but i commend major league baseball for doing that and then also even the concussion leave which is a little bit different than the regular disabled list they're taking actions just to change the game and support their players a little bit more well the important thing too is that these guys are multi-million dollar mm -hmm. investments and concussions yes. especially and it took the NHL to really lead the way on this because, you know, let's face it, guys do get concussions as a rule in the NHL. And the problem is bringing them back too fast leads to even more problems. Correct. There goes your investment. Hello, Eric Lindros. Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Great player. And now Sidney Crosby, same problem. Mm -hmm. Crosby actually had a setback. He disclosed that today. Yes. He actually had a setback before he was planning on getting back in just in time for the Penguins in the playoffs. He said, had yes. to shut it down. Very true. And that is something that people are starting to pay attention to, especially when the NFL mm -hmm. started realizing, this is due to you know, post-mortem experimentation sure. on people, on these guys' brains, that these concussions have long-term effects, and you can't mess with them. Absolutely. You have to take them extremely seriously and much more seriously than you have in the past. Now, concussions are a little bit less common in baseball. Yes, they are. Okay? Absolutely. You can get them from getting hit in the head. You can get them from getting hit by, a, by an oncoming runner. But catchers get them a lot. Absolutely. The okay? collisions at the plate. Yes, collisions in the field. Mm -hmm. They happen. And now people are much more mindful of them. Again, an advance in medicine because we discovered something we didn't know before. I was just telling our producer just before we went on the air, you don't know what it was like. Back in the day, <laughs> when Tommy John was an active pitcher before he had a surgery he that now bears been. his name. That's very okay? true. Before arthroscopes were invented, and these guys are walking around with these big uh, scars down their, their That's knees. True. That's very and true. Mickey Mantle having virtually a no cartilage brace. in his knees, okay, <laughs> walking in pain. Joe Namath 
getting operated on so many times, he now has fake knees. That's, yeah. Uh, That's ugly. Yeah, That's just very, ugly. very ugly. I, just in the last, but just in one, one little 10 year span from like 1975 to 1985, it just advanced in leaps and bounds. Absolutely. And imaging, as we said, MRIs and CAT scans and things like that, much better. So you can diagnose problems more easily and you get more mileage out of guys. Now, now that you got all this though, Mm -hmm. You have all these wonderful uh, medical miracles. Sure. Still, <laughs> pictures are babied a lot more than absolutely. they were. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. If you get more yeah. mileage out of them, nope. That's true. Staying in the National League East, <laughs> we talked about the Philadelphia Phillies, the problems of the Atlanta Braves. How about a team that's right there? Right behind the Philadelphia Phillies are the Florida Marlins. Very quietly, they are getting it done. 15 and 8. The Marlins, you don't really think about them too much, but they were competitive last season, and here they are again. Again, we're very early into the season. We're still in April, but at the same time, the Marlins are showing no signs of just wanting to fade back to the pack. Pitching has That's a lot to word. do with it. Has a lot to do with it. Now, it's the pitching's been so good that my uh, my boy, my Stony Brook uh, fellow alum, uh, Tom Kohler has one ERA and three starts down in New wow. Orleans, and he may have to wait a while to get called up. Very true. Any time that a team has outstanding pitching, they're going to stay at the top of the pack. They are always going to be competitive because if your pitching staff gives up, let's say, two runs a game, it shouldn't be that hard to score three. You're always going to be competitive. You're always going to be in every ball game. And for the Florida Marlins, this is their last season in that ballpark. And I would like to think that they can be very competitive for the rest of the season and maybe even the postseason, but who knows, that is a long ways away. But we do have a caller on the line, and I will say welcome to the warning track. How are you? Uh, this is Joe Block calling in the show for, for Brent. Hey, hey, Joe. How are you? Joe Block, how are you? Joe Block is the host of Dodger Talk, everybody. And Joe, hey, welcome. You're on with Matt and Brett. How are you, sir? Hey, really good to talk to you guys. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Well, we know that you guys, well, first off, we know your time is very short, so we will not keep you. I've got one quick question. I'm sure Mank has another one. Being a New Yorker, how is Don Mattingly just adjusting to, I'm not going to say life in L.A. because he's obviously been the coach over the last couple of years, taking over for Tory, but now that he's the managerial figure out there, how's he adapting to everybody? Well, he's uh, really uh, taking a managing very well. And uh, one of his great uh, hallmarks has been so far is it's a really even attitude. And, I mean, you figure on a team that so far is 500, uh, it probably helps to have an even manager. Um, but uh, all kidding aside, he's just been uh, a guy that uh, when a player is down, down. So Paying attention to him, and, uh, and the player is up. Uh, like they got Camper Andre here with his hitting streak right now. Uh, he paid the same type of attention to them. So the players have really responded to that, and uh, he's he done a nice job as a tactician too. Very good. Mike. Tell me about Andre Ethier though, because what he's been doing with this hitting streak, uh, I mean, I, I'm hearing names like Hank Aaron being thrown out there. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, this hitting streak, getting a little bit of feedback there. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, we're talking about Andre Ethier and uh, this hitting streak that he's on right now that's been absolutely crazy. Uh, they're drawing parallels to a streak that Hank Aaron hit had back in 1959, where he was getting three hit games all over the place as well. And this is, I mean, it's not just one hit per game. No, he's it's having two, a couple. He's it's having multiple a hits per game. And this tear that he's been on, obviously, it's got to be something that's keeping the Dodgers on even keel in addition to Mattingly. But it must be absolutely amazing to watch. Still have him? You know what? I don't mean to diminish your enthusiasm for it. I mean, it's always remarkable to for someone who has such a consistency at the plate. But the way that Matt Kemp was locked in earlier in the season, I think that was uh, kind of more uh, amazing to watch. Ethier has really flown under the radar, and I think people are just now starting to take notice that he's hit in 
dozen straight games because it's usually uh, maybe a first inning single. Um, you know, the, the, the hit, though, uh, the hit that uh, extended the streak hasn't been all that important, but he's gotten some, uh, some key hits later in games for his second or maybe third hit of the day um, that have, you know, helped this club. I mean, he's just been so consistent that you really, it, it hasn't really been all that eye popping, whereas Matt Kemp maybe is hitting a game winning home run. Uh, Andre Ethier is maybe hitting the double to set him up, uh, mm-hmm. or maybe driving in the tying run in the seventh inning. So he's still coming up with clutch hits, and he's still coming up with lots of hits, but it hasn't been uh, passing the eye test. It hasn't really been all that uh, eye popping, uh, but it's just been, when you look at the, the, collect, uh, the collection of uh, the streak, uh, it really is very impressive. Yeah, 25 of 26 games he has hit in, and uh, he's the 11th player to do that since 1919. He's been in some uh, incredible company here. We just talked about Hank Aaron, who had, uh, who has actually has the most hits out of those people, 53. But George Sisler, Charlie Grimm, Bill Terry, Al Kaline, Rico Cardi, and the uh, list just goes on and on. And this has to be something that the Dodger, Dodger fans can focus on too. But the one thing I do want to ask you, though, we are talking about Cleveland, for example, not drawing very well, and we are blaming the weather a little bit. Sure. Los Angeles doesn't have that problem. Now, is, is the attendance starting to pick up a little bit as the team's been playing better? Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't here last year, so I don't have anything really to compare it to. Um, but uh, in terms of the fan interest, it's always been... You know, this has always been a, a, a team that the, the a lot of attention. Uh, you know, the team has not come out of the gates blazing, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't think they were really expected to. Uh, the injuries have been uh, significant uh, as uh, their starting infield has only played together twice this year. Wow. And, uh, wow. you know, okay. there's only there's six guys right now that are on the roster that either were non-roster invitees or have played in the minors so far this year. So. Uh, picked out of 25. That's a lot. So once you get to that point, you know, you're just trying to tread water, and the Dodgers have done that so far. So it's hard to really get overly enthusiastic through 26 games about a 500 team. But again, when you look at, you know, what they've been able to do considering uh, all the attrition, uh, they're hanging around, and uh, and they're playing a lot of close games. So they're always in it every night, and uh, I think the best uh, of this team will come later in this season. Joe, we appreciate your time. I know you have a game to prepare for, but uh, yeah, three games set against the Padres, and I believe it's Ted Lilly on the hill for you guys this evening? That's right, Lilly and uh, Clayton Richard, the lefty. So uh, Ethier is going to have a hard time hitting the left-hander. We'll see. Joe, thanks again for your time, and hey, hopefully we'll talk to you down the road. Good luck with everything. We appreciate the call. All right, thanks, guys. My pleasure. All righty, that is Joe Block, host of Dodger Talk out in Los Angeles, and I think he brought some great insight to the show. Absolutely, because that's something we don't get to hear a lot of out on the East Coast, what the uh, team's struggles are as far Correct. as the, the, just the disabled <laughs> list and the, and the roster is concerned. Forget about off the field. Uh, but the one thing that, of course, always yeah, gives me a little bit of a, a, a smile, I guess, mm-hmm. is that how Ted Lilly always seems to find work. He does. He is a former everybody. left Called Blue Jay, Yankee. That's, That's why. <laughs> absolutely. If you are a lefty, you can stay in this game a very long time. Just ask Arthur Rhodes. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah, a well, he's great against everybody time. except the Yankees. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. As we wrap up the show, it is time for Mank on the Spot. So this is the segment where each and every week we ask Matt Mankwitz an off-the-cuff but pertinent question. Today... The question resolves or involves two managers, one on the north side of Chicago, one on the south side of Chicago. We're talking about Mike Quaidy and Ozzie Guillen, two different styles of managers. Who's the first to go? Wow. Yeah. You know what? It's a great <laughs> question. However, I will say that Ozzie Guillen could have, would have, and should have, in many cases, and maybe under different conditions, might have been fired a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Except for two very important things. Number one, name another living White Sox manager with a World Series ring. It's hard to do. I don't name think you can. Name another one that has been dead for 50 <laughs> years. Very true. Okay, number one. Number two, as much as he's gotten some criticism for the team's relative lack of success since 2005, you know, 
he's also brought a lot of attention to Absolutely. them that he might, they might not have otherwise had. Absolutely. A lot of people in the media think he's a great interview. Mm -hmm. He tells it like it is. Definitely. And, you know, sometimes he goes off a little bit. He has a personality. Correct. Okay? And a very agreeable personality most of the time. When he goes off, he's not going off on anyone in particular. Right. Yeah, no, he, he tells it like it is. He might have something to say about the way his team's playing or, or a bad call sure. or he just got suspended for a couple Absolutely. of games. Whatever happens, it's not necessarily singling somebody out. Correct. And that's the kind of thing that, that's, I think, healthy, especially for a team that has not distinguished itself all that much in recent Correct. years. And I'll even take it a step further, Matt. Does either one exit this season? No. I agree. I definitely agree with you. And, again, for the same reason. I also think that the White Sox worst days are behind them. Okay, and that's, I, that's uh, a huge and, factor. And the reason that I brought up the question That 9 out of 10 is... streak, I think their worst days are behind them, simply because they saw them play against the Yankees this mm -hmm. week uh, and went to a couple of the games. I was at Yankee Stadium, and I thought that they were starting to come around a little bit. They, of course, dropped two games to the Yankees. Absolutely. They won the first two. And, but they were getting some good pitching in those first two. And as we so know, at least that's the front the of their of the rotation, game. At least the front of their rotation is going to be halfway decent. And they were getting some timely hitting, too. However... You know, again, it goes back to what the rest of the team is going to do. Definitely. Just like the big question we have with the Yankees themselves. Sure. Okay, oh yeah, we, we can pencil in CC, and mm -hmm. then, who, then who else? Right. Well, that's going to be the same problem here. Burley turned in a good performance the other day, should have won. Again, there were a couple of situations where the bullpen let them down. There are a couple of situations where they didn't hit. Regardless, I think they'll be competitive. Are we How, saying the Cubs? Are we saying Mike Quady goes first? Pressed, pressed. That's what. Pressed. That's what this I say yes, is about. only because mm -hmm. they're the Cubs. Wow. wow. And okay, that's because, uh... like I said, there aren't too many things Ozzy Guillen could do to get him fired that he hasn't already done. Agreed, and that is why I definitely yeah. agree with you. Unless mm -hmm. it's like a three thirty three winning percentage. Right. That unless might they, get him gone. Unless they flat out tank. Indeed, Guillen yeah. has done enough to earn his job or to keep his job for the remainder of the year and hopefully beyond hey. because I definitely like his character. Honestly, do you think in the city of Chicago, especially on the south side, that he pays for a drink or dinner? Absolutely not. Terry <laughs> Francona uh, doesn't in Boston either. Uh, it's almost like Matt Mankiewicz in New York. I don't think he pays for too much either. And on that Just note... Just because know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we are going to wrap up this edition of The Warning Track. As always, we have had a good time. We had Joe Block the Dodger Talk Insider. Each and every week we try to go inside of a club or the mind of a former major leaguer. We like to do it all here at sports.com. We're here for you and we'll be here next week on The Warning Track.